Arteteki, gdzie za moment, za minutę zacznie się, już właściwie zaczyna się kolejne spotkanie, tym razem z Willemem, Willemem de Greve, dyrektorem Strip Muzeum, Muzeum Komiksu w Brukseli, muzeum, do jakiego aspirujemy tu w Krakowie, które nam się szalenie podoba, które chcielibyśmy w jakimś sensie naśladować. Willem nam opowie o tym, jak muzeum działa w Brukseli, jakie są jego obowiązki w tej placówce, jakie są plany tej placówki, a na koniec sobie trochę podyskutujemy, być może się do tego odniesiemy, coś opowiemy też o naszych planach tu w Krakowie dotyczących utworzenia Muzeum Komiksu. Także wszystkich Państwa serdecznie zapraszam tutaj do nas. Proszę się do nas przyciąć, posłuchać tego wystąpienia. Wystąpienie pana de Grewy będzie się odbywać w języku angielskim. Mam myślę, że sobie Państwo wszyscy doskonale z nim poradzą. Będzie czas na pytania. So, I just said a few words about you. And I guess this is the time that I will pass mic to you. So, hello. Dzień dobry, cześć. Hello, um, friends of uh, Krakow and uh, Poland. It's my third time uh, here in Krakow, and I must say it's always a great pleasure uh, to be here. The first two times was for tourism. Um, I'm very happy uh, to be here, uh, partly pro for professional reasons. I want to thank organization um, Artur Tomek um, to invite me and also Wallonia Brussels International for the support. Um, in this talk, there are um, two uh, topics I want to treat with you. First, I will um, explain why we Belgians, we have such a big comic strip tradition. Uh, there are uh, comics are everywhere, and I think it's interesting to find out why it's Belgium, why it's not uh, Portugal or Austria or uh, Norway. And the second part of my talk, uh, this will be a short overview, a historical overview of Belgian comics. So, let's start. Oh, F5, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Belgium, the kingdom of the ninth art. Um, the ninth art, because we consider in Belgium comics really as an art. Now, this term was invented by a Belgian comic artist. I think you're all familiar with him. It's uh, Maurice, the father of Lucky Luke. Maurice was not only drawing comics, um, in the 1960s he was also writing some articles about comics, and in one of these articles he spoke about the ninth art. And I think it's very true. Um, we Belgians, we didn't invent comics. Uh, I will talk later about it. Uh, comics come from the US. But I think we invited the ninth art. Before I start to explain why we Belgians have such a comic strip tradition, um, I will briefly introduce um, our museum, the museum I represent here today, the Comic Strip Museum of Brussels. Now, uh, this is what you will see if you come to visit us. Um, you can see uh, it's a, it's a beautiful building. It's a Art Nouveau style building from 1906. And then inside um, we have a um, very uh, big staircase. And as you can see, uh, sometimes a lot of people queuing to buy a ticket um, because we are lucky to be one of the most visited museums in, uh, in Brussels. Every year we welcome about uh, 220,000 uh, visitors. And more than 80% of these people come from outside of Belgium. Here is an image of the first floor. You can see the castle of uh, Tintin. It's the permanent uh, Tintin exhibition. 
And as I said, uh, the architecture of the building is, uh, is very special. It's uh, called Art Nouveau style. Uh, it's French, it means new style. Um, this style was very popular um, around uh, 1900. And why was it called new style? Uh, because of the use of industrial techniques, uh, iron, steel, as you can see here, uh, this was before uh, mainly applied in industrial architecture. Well, Art Nouveau, they use it also for uh, private houses or um, buildings like, uh, like ours. Um, the combination of our nouveau style and comics makes our museum very typical for Brussels. Uh, why? Because um, we have a junction of two art forms for which Brussels is, uh, is known together in one place. Brussels is known uh, very much for comic strips, of course, but also for our nouveau buildings. If you go to Brussels, you will see everywhere, especially in the suburbs, uh, beautiful our nouveau buildings. And our uh, building was designed by Victor Horta. And Victor Horta, that's, uh, that's a man. Uh, he is in Belgium, the most famous architect of uh, our nouveau style. Here we see a picture. And this is the version of a Belgian comic strip artist, is uh, Frank P. And um, so you can see um, Horta is uh, thinking, reflecting, because uh, he is uh, thinking about his uh, new project, uh, our uh, building, our museum. Um, but the comic artist, he made like a little joke, because uh, here we see the plans of the building. And what we see here in the sideline, some heads of uh, Belgian comic strip artists. Victor Horta, he was never aware that one day uh, his uh, building would become a comic strip museum because the museum dates from uh, 1989. Uh, the building is from 1906. Uh, but uh, everything is possible in the imagination of a comic strip artist. Now, um, as you guessed, um, so uh, Horta, he didn't construct the building to be a museum. No. It was a warehouse for textile. Tailors came to buy their uh, tissues, um, fabrics. Uh, this is a picture from about 100 years ago. And you can see uh, the central uh, hall of uh, our building, uh, full with lots of fabrics, and these were ready to leave by train. And this is the same spot uh, today. Uh, so uh, architecture didn't change so much because uh, we are always very respectful to the building. But of course, we added some uh, comic strip uh, decoration. You see Lucky Luke, you see the rocket of uh, Tintin. There is a, a De Chauveau car. It's the car of comic strip characters uh, Bull and Bill. And uh, there are many other details uh, upstairs. Now, um, the museum was uh, opened in 1989. This means that now we are preparing our third anniversary. It will be next year on October. And the museum was inaugurated by the former Belgian king and queen, King Baudouin and uh, Queen Fabiola. Uh, just to show you that um, all Belgian people uh, love comics, our royal family included, because uh, all royals, uh, they came to our museum. Um, two years ago, we had the actual king with his four children uh, for um, a very pleasant afternoon in our museum. Uh, so this was uh, 1989, the opening inauguration of the museum. And here, I have the same event seen through the eyes of a comic strip artist. It's a drawing by Johan de Moor, the son of Bob de Moor, who was the right hand of uh, Hergé. So we see the king uh, coming down our staircase, and he's welcomed, uh, greeted by a bunch of uh, Belgian comic strip characters, uh, Tintin, uh, Gaston Lagaffe, uh, Blake Amour, Timur Spirou, uh, Smurf. And they are very uh, joyful, happy. Why? Because at last, they found their home at Brussels. Now, um, 
what can you see in the museum? There are several permanent exhibitions. Uh, we explain uh, how we make a comic strip. We show original documents. Um, but we also have uh, big temporary exhibitions. We have four in a year. And now we are very proud of uh, this exhibition, a Panorama of Chinese Comic Strips. Uh, it's an uh, exhibition we made in partnership with the Chinese government. And it's the first time in Europe that a uh, historical overview of uh, Chinese comics is uh, shown. But we don't do only exhibitions, there's much more than this. Um, sometimes we have in our museum uh, family weekends uh, with uh, animations for uh, children, uh, teenagers. Um, sometimes we have uh, talks. This was uh, the American theoretician about comics, uh, Scott McCloud, uh, giving a lecture about uh, his books uh, for uh, students and young comic strip artists. Here a lecture with, uh, in collaboration with the Korean Cultural Center uh, who invited uh, several uh, Korean uh, comic artists to get in debate with uh, Belgian artists. We also do uh, conservation. Uh, of course, uh, books. Uh, this is a picture of our um, uh, library. Uh, in this library, we have about uh, 80,000 titles of uh, comic strips. Uh, before, we used to collect all books, but now, uh, since we have a lack of space, um, we, we uh, focus on the two languages of Belgium, uh, Dutch and French. And we also have like uh, 4,000 um, theoretical books about uh, comics, uh, like uh, biographies, uh, theses, and so on. There's also a reading room, a separate part, and this is included in a museum ticket. So um, all people coming to our museum, after their visit, they can discover the books themselves um, downstairs in the library. And uh, what's more, since we have such an international audience, um, we have their uh, comic books in more than 40 languages. Uh, of course, we have uh, German, English, Polish, and French, but also exotic languages like Malaysian, uh, Serbian, uh, Indonesian, and uh, much more. But conservation, it's not only books. We also have a collection of uh, original documents, uh, original uh, drawings. We have a collection of about 8,000 uh, drawings. And all these uh, drawings, they are digitalized. It's a lot of work uh, because it's not only our collection that we digitalize, also um, all the documents of our temporary exhibition. Uh, like now, we have uh, this uh, exhibition about uh, Chinese comic strips. There are about uh, 300 original documents uh, who come from China. Well, uh, before framing them, we all have uh, digitalized them. Um, why do we do this? Well, um, sometimes uh, original drawings, uh, it's uh, for the moment easy to get them. But you never know what will happen in five, ten years. Perhaps uh, a private collector has, uh, has bought uh, these original drawings and uh, he doesn't allow them to get out of his uh, safe um, or uh, they disappeared. Well, in that case, we still have a digital trace of uh, these uh, drawings and we can contribute to a publication or even to an exhibition. Of course, uh, we also want to encourage uh, young talent. Uh, that's why we uh, organize um, workshops, initiation workshops, uh, comic strip drawing for children and teenagers. And what we do every year, and this might be interesting, I don't know if there are uh, artists uh, present here, um, but every year we have um, a meeting with um, between artists, young artists and publishers. So uh, we invite um, um, the most important uh, Belgian but also French and Dutch uh, publishers, uh, the big ones like uh, Dargo, Casterman, Dupuis and so on, but also uh, the smaller one. And um, comic strip artists, they just can uh, queue and uh, show their work. 
And it's very um, useful to have them all united because what happens very often is that uh, one publisher says, yeah, it's your, what you're drawing, it's not really my cup of tea, but I'm sure my colleague there, uh, he will like it, uh, take a look over there. And uh, we are proud that uh, thanks to this uh, annual workshop, we uh, contributed to um, almost uh, 10 uh, publications, also translations. For example, a Dutch artist coming, meeting a French publisher and uh, they agreed about uh, translation or vice versa. Of course I could speak for, uh, for one hour about our museum but this is not the purpose of my talk. Um, I hope you can come one day to visit us and if not there's another way because we were uh, the first um, museum in Belgium accessible on uh, Google Street View. So, um, even at home, you can uh, pay a visit to our museum. So far, the presentation of the museum I represent. Now, uh, let's go to the first part of my talk. Uh, Belgium is um, known, famous for its comic strip tradition. And if you come to Belgium, you will see comics everywhere. This is um, a picture of our seaside, and uh, there is um, a town at uh, the seaside uh, full with uh, statues of uh, comic strip characters. And every year, they inaugurate a new uh, statue. This is a picture from uh, Charleroi. It's, um, a town in south of Belgium, in Wallonia. And Charleroi was uh, famous because there was the house of the publisher uh, Dupuis. Dupuis is the publisher of many famous comics like uh, Spirou, Smurfs, and Lucky Luke. And as you can see, uh, they decorate the city with uh, comic strip characters that were born in this city, like the Marsupilami of uh, Franquin. But uh, there is no place in Belgium where comics are so present as in Brussels. Um, we have in Brussels the comic strip walk. There are about uh, 50, 50 murals uh, decorated with uh, comic strip characters. This was the very first one in 1991. Um, and every year, uh, the city of Brussels, in uh, partnership with our museum, um, inaugurates uh, three, four new walls. And as you can see, um, the comic strip artist, uh, he adapts his drawing in function of the city and the neighborhood. Uh, here, for example, uh, you can see that um, the terrace of this pub is reflected on the drawing. Um, and um, the houses uh, are the houses uh, you can see around in the neighborhood. Or uh, there uh, to the left, uh, we have um, allusion to our most famous statue, uh, Manic and Peace. Uh, the comic strip dog, Cubitus, uh, has taken his place. And this, I think, it's uh, my favorite comic strip wall. It's um, the, the comic series uh, Ricochet. And as you can see, the artist, he made like um, a game with the existing house here. And just like the, the walls are uh, continuing to the left. Another example. Not only uh, comic strip murals, also uh, statues. Um, one of my favorite uh, comic strip characters, uh, Gaston Lagaffe, um, has his statue. And the statue is uh, very important for our museum because the building you can see here, it's our museum. So uh, Gaston Lagaffe, uh, he's uh, guarding the way and he's also signposting because if people phone to our museum asking how can I find you, well, uh, very easy to explain, you just get out of the station, uh, you take the avenue and then uh, Gaston, he will show you the wall, the way. By the way, um, Gaston Lagaffe uh, will be adapted for the very first time into uh, pictures. Uh, the film is uh, coming out uh, next week. And we were happy that uh, the main actor, uh, he came to say hello to the Inner Museum uh, last week.
And what is more, uh, of course, uh, comic strip shops, uh, libraries, uh, very often with a gallery. Uh, for the moment, in Brussels, there are like uh, 30 specialized uh, comic strip libraries. And museums, of course, uh, not only our museum. Uh, in front of our museum is uh, one museum dedicated to Sir Mark Sleen, um, a Flemish artist uh, who is uh, featuring the Guinness Book of Records for the biggest comic strip production in the world. But I will tell more about him in the second part in the historical overview. But so uh, this museum um, is uh, part of a foundation, but run by our museum. Our staff is also working there. And for one euro um, extra, you can also uh, go uh, in this smaller museum. So I think um, it's clear that uh, comic strips are everywhere in Belgium. Um, not only on the streets, also in the houses of uh, Belgian people, because Every Belgium has at home a collection of comic books. Can be small, only 10, 20 books, or it can be huge, uh, thousands. Um, all Belgian people, they know comic strips, uh, they read them or have read them, but most of all, Belgian people are proud of comic strips. It's part of our patrimony, just like uh, chocolate, beer, surrealism. Um, now, um, why uh, is it Belgium? Well, um, there are two uh, reasons for this. The first reason is, uh, is quite simple, is historical. Is this man, Hergé. Hergé, the creator of uh, Tintin. Um, you see a picture to the left. And to the right, it's a tribute drawing of Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol admired uh, the Tintin and uh, Hergé, so that's why this tribute drawing. Um, why um, is Hergé so important for the development of Belgian comics? Some people could think that he was the first comic strip creator in the world. Well, no, that's false, because um, Tintin started in 1929. A long time before him, there were um, comics in the US. This is the comic that uh, we consider as the very first one. There's, a lot, there's some discussion about this, but we um, think that uh, this comic, uh, The Yellow Kid, um, made by an Irish immigrant, uh, Richard Altcott, created in 1896, uh, that this was the very first uh, comic strip. So, uh, Tintin was not the first comic strip in the world. Perhaps he was the first comic strip artist in Europe. Well, no, again, that's false, because before him, uh, there was already um, a popular comic strip in, in France, uh, Alain saint augan uh, Zige Puce. Um, and this comic even inspired Hergé for his Tintin. And even in Belgium, Hergé was not the first one. Because uh, here we see um, Georges Van Ramdonk, and uh, he made his, uh, this comic series in 1922, uh, seven years before Tintin. Um, it was not published in Belgium, it was published in the Netherlands because uh, Georges Van Ramdonk was a refugee. Uh, in the First World War, uh, he escaped Belgium and uh, he went to the Netherlands. He stayed there, uh, he got in touch with, um, with a Dutch newspaper and there he published his, uh, his very first uh, comic strip. Um, so although it was published in the Netherlands, still uh, we can consider this as, the, as one of the first Belgian comic strips. And it was seven years before Tintin. So, Tintin, not the first comic strip in the world, uh, nor in Europe, nor in Belgium. But we can say that Tintin was one of the first um, famous comic strips. Because from the beginning, uh, Tintin was a huge success. And um, Hergé, he also became celebrous uh, with his uh, comic strips. And to show you how it worked, so this was the first story, uh, Tintin in the land of Soviet Union. 
This was published in a newspaper. Every day uh, it was a page. And this is the last page. And what we can see here, um, so Tintin, he went by train to, uh, to Russia, to, to Moscow. Um, and uh, here, um, he's coming back from his trip. And he's very excited because uh, they are approaching uh, Belgium. Uh, so he says, uh, look, uh, Snowy, we are uh, now in Liège. Um, then um, Tillemont getting closer to Brussels. And then the, the last panel, we see the former North Station in Brussels. It doesn't exist anymore. And we see the square is full with, uh, with people. And all these people are waiting to, uh, to see uh, Tintin, to welcome him back after his uh, trip to, uh, to Russia. Now, um, this was uh, published in the newspaper every day. So there was uh, one page. And uh, the newspaper, they did like a marketing stunt. And uh, they headlined, um, big news, this Saturday, Tintin is coming back from Russia. Come to see Tintin at the North Station. Of course, um, Belgian people were not stupid. They knew it was just an actor. It was, uh, it was fake. That's what the newspaper uh, did. They hired uh, somebody who looked like Tintin. They also found uh, a fox terrier dog to, uh, to act like uh, Snowy. And so the um, actor, he just had to walk out uh, the North Station and make a tour and greet uh, some fans. Well. On the, the drawing of Hershey, you can see the square is full with people. In fact, this was quite realistic. Because here, I have a picture how it was in 1929. So you see, the, the whole square was there full with people, all waiting to see their, um, their idol, their um, famous comic strip hero, uh, Tintin, uh, making a tour in the car uh, with, uh, with his dog. Despite this was only the first story of Tintin, the impact was uh, huge. And uh, with the, the following stories, the success of, uh, of Tintin was only increasing. It was a real phenomenon. Now, why is this so important for the development of Belgian comics? Um, the success of Hergé, who was, by the way, very young, uh, at that time he was 22 years old, uh, this may dream a lot of young Belgian people. They saw this success by somebody who uh, became famous just by uh, drawing uh, um, a comic strip hero. And um, the success uh, motivated young Belgian people to follow his example. And um, like, just like uh, happens in sports sometimes, when a country has, for example, a good tennis player, you can see everywhere teenagers uh, playing tennis because they have their national example. Well, more or less the same happened with uh, Hergé and uh, comic strip artists. Um, we could say that Hergé was like the locomotive of a whole train of uh, young Belgian comic strip talent. So far, uh, the first explanation, the historical reason. The second explanation is uh, cultural. Now, this is not a comic, uh, although, although um, it's uh, a famous Belgian painting from the 15th century, from the Van Eyck brothers. Uh, it's the mystic lamp. You can find it in the cathedral of, uh, of Kent, my hometown. And uh, why am I showing this picture? Well, um, it's, a, it's a marvelous example of uh, water painting. And um, it's almost for sure that if not the Belgium, the Flemish, uh, didn't invent uh, water painting, they were the ones to uh, make this procedure um, famous and um, it was a start to spread out, spread out all over Europe. Um, just to show you that Belgian people always had a fascination for images, for visual communication. Um, another example is again a painting. Uh, this is from the 16th century. 
It's a painting from uh, Bruegel. And uh, this painting is telling an episode from the Bible, the massacre of the innocent children. Now, I don't know if you are familiar with this uh, Bible episode, but uh, it happened uh, when uh, Jesus was born, uh, the king, the governor of, uh, of uh, Palestine, um, King Herodes, uh, he heard about this, and they said, uh, this uh, Jesus, he will be the Messiah, he will get uh, the power. Well, um, Herodes, he was afraid uh, of this. He saw it like a threat of his authority. And he sent his soldiers all out all over the country to kill the newborn uh, sons. Now, if you see this painting, it's, uh, it's a snow landscape. It's not so likely that this is uh, Palestina. And the farms, the farms are very similar to the farms you can find in uh, the region around uh, Brussels, the Peuteland. And the farmers, they are really dressed like uh, Belgian farmers uh, were at that time in the 16th century. But it becomes very interesting when you take a look at uh, the soldiers of uh, King Herodes, because the soldiers, they wear Spanish uniforms. Because at that time, Belgium was suffering from Spanish uh, occupation. There was the um, um, Inquisition. Uh, Protestants, they were um, tribed and also uh, executed. Um, and um, this was a very uh, um, tough time for, for Belgium. Here I have a detail of these uh, Spanish soldiers, and you can see they are very cruel uh, with uh, killing the, the children. Now, in fact, uh, there was a clear message in this painting. It's, just, it's not just a decoration. The painter was, wanted to say, uh, Spanish people, they are killing um, our population. Now, uh, a very strong message, and although everybody in Belgium uh, seeing this uh, painting uh, understood what was happening, there was not um, a, um, a consequence for the painter. The Spanish occupants, they had some discussions about this. They said, is this not uh, offensive for, uh, for us? But then the conclusion was, no. It's just a painting, it's not so harmful. Why? Um, well, uh, Spaniards, like uh, most other nations, they have a classic form of communication, the communication of words, the communication of texts. And uh, we Belgian people, um, we are more uh, in favor of the visual communication. Um, so uh, that's why the painter, he could uh, produce this painting without uh, being uh, tribed. Um, why Belgian people are so uh, keen on visual communication? It's due to, our, to uh, the identity of our nation. As you might know, uh, Belgium is a small country. We have about 11 million inhabitants. But we're also a very complicated country. We have three national languages, French, Dutch, and a little bit of German. But besides, uh, during our history, Belgium was occupied by almost whole Western Europe. At one time, we were occupied by the Spaniards, as you can see there, uh, by the Austrians, like uh, some parts of uh, Poland was the same period, the Habsburgs. Uh, we were also occupied by the French, by Napoleon, and uh, the Dutch. Now, um, this had consequences also for communication because at one period uh, people spoke more French, then it was more Dutch, then there was also some German or some uh, Spanish. Um, but most of all, communication was complicated in our regions and uh, people were mixing all the time uh, languages. So, since the classical com communication was not that efficient, we don't have to be surprised that uh, Belgians, um, they have uh, understood very quickly that visual communication was so much uh, easier, so much more efficient, efficient than uh, classical communication.
uh, communication. So, um, not surprising neither that um, when the comic strips uh, born in the US at the end of the 19th century, when they crossed the Atlantic Ocean and came to Europe, well, no surprise that it were the Belgian people who adopted uh, comics from the beginning because it fits so well with our national identity, our uh, fascination for visual communication. By the way, uh, comics were born in the USA at the end of the 19th century, more particularly in New York. How was New York at uh, that time? Well. It was a crossroad for cultures from all over the world. There were immigrants from uh, Germany, from Italy, from uh, Ireland, uh, from China. Um, not all those people, they spoke very well English. And um, very often in the newspaper, the only page they really could appreciate was the page with the comic strips. So, no surprise that comic strips were born in the multicultural, multilinguistical uh, city of New York, and no surprise that uh, Belgium was the second country to adopt uh, comic strip culture. So, this is the end of my first part, um, the explanation why Belgium has such a big comic strip tradition. Let's now switch to the second part, uh, a short historical overview of our uh, comic strip tradition. And again, we start with this uh, young man, uh, Tintin, uh, 1929. Um, although he was not the very first uh, comic strip uh, hero in Belgium, he was the, the very first uh, famous comic strip hero, and still today, it's uh, one of our national uh, comic strip ambassadors. Uh, he's still very, very successful. Although the last book dates from 1976, uh, still uh, comic books of Tintin are sold all over the world. And uh, here we see Tintin um, on the train, uh, ready to leave to uh, Moscow. Now, um, if you take a look at his hair, uh, you can see he, his hair is quite flat. It doesn't have uh, the, the typical quiff in the hair uh, yet. Now, uh, this quiff he received on page 7 of this story. Um, there he's driving a convertible car. There's a breeze of wind uh, which makes his uh, hair uh, rise up. But when he's out of the car, he still has got the quiff. Well, Hergé, he drew it by uh, accident, and he found it better because, because it gives more uh, personality to his character, and he kept it like this. And um, even in the Dutch translation of uh, Tintin, it's uh, kuifje, and this means little quiff. So uh, this uh, hairstyle is very important for the image of, um, of uh, our uh, comic, famous comic strip hero. Here uh, we see uh, Tintin disguised as a Chinese boy. It's an uh, extract of um, the story The Blue Lotus. And then uh, we see uh, there uh, Tintin as a, as a black boy. Um, and there he's spying the conversation of uh, two bandits. And then uh, we see um, some pages later, he's um, taking off his disguise and uh, arresting the two bandits. Um, if you take a look to the comic books of Tintin, you will see that very often he's disguising himself as an old man, an old lady, a Chinese, African, Indian, and uh, so on. For Tintin, it's very easy to disguise himself. Why? Because um, he's a very neutral character. Um, if you take a look at his face, uh, the eyes are just two black spots. He has a very small nose and uh, a little mouth. Um, his uh, face is almost like a mask. Now, I think it's also an explanation uh, why um, Tintin is so successful all around the world. Uh, because it's really easy to identify yourself with uh, this character. 
It doesn't matter if you are uh, European, African, Asian, American. Almost everybody can find something of him or even herself in the character of Tintin. Um, a French philosopher, Michel Serre, he said, Tintin is like an empty envelope. You open it and you can put in whatever you want. So very easy to identify yourself with Tintin and uh, leave on adventure with him. Now, uh, the first stories of Tintin, they were uh, quite political, um, especially Tintin in the land of Soviet Union, because the story was published in um, a Catholic uh, right-wing uh, conservative newspaper. Um, at the head of the youth supplement was uh, a priest, an abbot, and uh, he said, uh, Hergé, who was very young, uh, you should teach Belgian children that uh, communism is, uh, is a very dangerous. And, um, and he gave uh, some books to uh, Hergé, who was not interested in politics. He read these books and uh, he was very impressed. And so all this he used uh, for the first story, uh, Tintin in the land of Soviet Union. And this continued because the second book is Tintin in Congo. And there uh, the message was, uh, teach Belgium children that uh, we Belgian people, we are doing good work in uh, Congo. We are uh, educating Africans and uh, so on. And um, this continued until the fifth book here, uh, The Blue Lotus. And for this story, uh, Hergé got in touch with a Chinese student, uh, Chang, living in uh, Brussels, a student of uh, arts. And Hergé spent several uh, evenings with uh, Chang discussing about uh, Chinese culture. So Hergé asked, um, what is religion in China? Uh, how does a street in Shanghai look like? And um, he got all this information. But what was more, um, he understood also that uh, documentation was very important. So here we see a scene of uh, a street in Shanghai, and um, we can be sure that um, it was really like this because he got all this information from uh, his uh, friend uh, Chang. Now, um, this was important for the career of Hergé. It was like a turning point because from that book on, Every story of Tintin was very well documented. Um, he wanted to be every detail uh, correct. Uh, he was doing a lot of research. Um, there is this, the two books of uh, the moon adventure when uh, Tintin and uh, his friends, they are making a trip to the moon. Before uh, Neil Armstrong, this was in 1953. Um, so Tintin was um, the first man, we can say, to, uh, to walk on the moon. Well, for these stories, Hergé, he was uh, writing to scientists and uh, asking really about the technical details, uh, how would the rocket look like, and uh, so on. Here we have 1938, and that again is a, a very important year for development of Belgian comics, is the birth of the comic strip magazine uh, Spirou. Now, uh, Spirou is a character, uh, it has his own story, still today um, it has his stories, but in the Spirou magazine uh, there were also other stories uh, published, also other series, and um, some of them are uh, the most famous uh, comic series of, um, of Belgium. Uh, Smurfs, um, Gaston Lagaffe, uh, Lucky Luke. All these uh, series were born in Spirou. And Spirou is still existing. Uh, so it's the longest uh, running comic strip magazine in Europe. Now, uh, this uh, first number is explained the birth of Spirou. And it's a very funny page, and I will uh, read it with you. Uh, because Spirou, as you can see, he's a bellboy. He's bringing luggage um, from hotel guests to their rooms. And the first panel is showing a hotel manager, and uh, he's uh, announcing an advertisement, looking for a bellboy who has to be young, dynamic, strong. Well, in the second panel, you see the candidates, they are everything except young, strong, and dynamic. So the manager has a problem, 
and he says, I have an idea to solve a situation. He goes to see a comic strip artist. It's a self-portrait of uh, Rob Vell, the first uh, artist, the creator of uh, Spirou. He asks uh, him, uh, can you help me? Can you create me a bellboy? And he says, uh, yes, no problem. Uh, he will be unique. And there he's uh, drawing uh, the contours of uh, Spirou. Then he vaporizes some eau de vie, means life water, it's, a, it's a, uh, a language joke, and then uh, Spirou is born. And a funny detail, here you can see the comic strip artist uh, getting his salary for the delivered work. So uh, the birth of uh, Spirou magazine, very, very important for development of Belgian comics. And the importance even grows um, eight years later, because in 1946, uh, Spirou gets a famous uh, competitor, because in 1946, we see the creation of the Tintin magazine. And uh, in the Tintin magazine, there were the stories of Tintin, but also uh, many other series, like uh, here you can see on this, uh, this cover, uh, Blake and Mortimer, uh, also a very famous uh, Belgian uh, comic strip magazine. And I think it's one of the most beautiful uh, covers ever made for, uh, in Belgian comics. Um, now, uh, since every magazine wanted to be the best, um, they, uh, they did a lot of effort to attract the best comic strip artists um, and they had all kinds of uh, tricks to convince uh, people to buy their magazines. Now, one trick was uh, very simple, increase the number of pages. Um, at one moment, um, Spirou magazine said, we can do better than Tintin. We, uh, instead of 16 pages, every week we have uh, 20 pages. Well, of course, uh, Tintin magazine could not uh, just accept this. And what they do, uh, three months later, they increase their pages to 24. And this continues, this games, um, by even at, uh, in, at, at one time in the 1970s, uh, Tintin magazine had almost uh, 70 pages. 70 is a lot uh, every week. So uh, 70, this means that they needed a lot of comic strips and also artists. And they were looking everywhere in Belgium and also outside of Belgium to get, attract um, artists. So uh, many artists, um, they got, in fact, um, a golden opportunity to create and to be published. By the way, uh, your famous compatriot, Grigor Oshinsky, uh, he was also uh, published in this magazine, in uh, Tintin magazine. One of our most famous uh, comic strip heroes still today, uh, Lucky Luke, the poor lonesome cowboy, created uh, in, by Morris in 1947 and uh, still uh, selling everywhere in, in Europe. Now, uh, Morris, it's a parody of uh, Western because uh, the artist Morris, he was a big fan of uh, movies, especially of uh, Westerns. And this we can see in his work because um, a reference to cinema are very obvious. Uh, if we see this half page, uh, the first panel is like a camera standing uh, upwards of the scene, of, um, of the saloon. And then uh, the second and the third panel is like the camera uh, coming down to give a side view on the action. Um, in Lucky Luke, um, you find all cliches of uh, Western movies. Uh, saloons, there are always uh, big fights. Uh, the Mexicans, they are lazy. Indians, they have funny smoke signals, um, and so on. And there's also um, a very typical profession of, uh, of Western movies that is appearing quite often in Lucky Luke stories, uh, the undertakers. Um, undertakers in Lucky Luke, they are um, very ugly people. 
Um, like here you can see um, his face uh, color is yellow. Uh, sometimes there's even a vulture sitting on their shoulder. These uh, people are very uh, macabre. Uh, they are uh, half dead, more dead than alive, in fact. There is a story about, because at school, uh, Morris, he was a very bad pupil. He was uh, getting uh, bad uh, points for every discipline, except for drawing. There he was the best. And uh, during the lessons, he was never listening to his teacher. He was always drawing. And in fact, secretly, he was making caricatures of his teachers. Well, he conserved all these uh, caricatures, and he recycled them because every undertaker of Lucky Luke, it's an old teacher of the artist. So I think it's a very funny way to take revenge for your school time. This is a drawing of uh, Spirou, and um, the drawing is made by Franquin. Franquin, he was not the artist who created Spirou. Um, Spirou was created by uh, Rob Vell, then it was taken over by Gigé, and uh, Franquin, he was the third uh, drawer of Spirou, but also the most talented and um, the most famous uh, drawer of uh, Spirou, because all the colorful side uh, characters, they were invented by uh, Franquin. Franquin was a real uh, genius. Um, even um, uh, Hergé, he said, if I compare myself to Franquin, I must admit that I am an inferior artist. So this is a very big compliment. This is uh, the most famous side character of uh, Spirou. It's called uh, the Marsipilami. Uh, Spirou and his friend Fantasio, on one book, they go to South America to the rainforest, and there they discover uh, this funny animal, the Marsipilami. Um, and uh, this is a story that uh, the Marsipilami finds a female. They make together a nest and they have uh, three children, uh, two yellow ones and one black one. This is the cover of the book, The Nest of the Marsipilami. Uh, by the way, this was a very personal story. It dates from 1957. And at that time, uh, the wife of Franquin was pregnant. Well, they only had uh, one daughter. Uh, so uh, this um, uh, personal event is reflected in this uh, comic book. Franquin, he also created um, uh, this uh, character, uh, Gaston Lagaffe, one of the first uh, um, anti-heroes in uh, European uh, comic strips because uh, Gaston, uh, he works at the redaction of the Spirou uh, magazine but in fact working is too much honor for him because he does everything except working. He's playing music, uh, sculpting, doing uh, scientific experiments, then the whole building explodes. Uh, very, very funny stories for people who are not familiar yet with uh, this character. I really advise you, uh, you will spend uh, very funny moments uh, together with uh, Gaston. So here, um, one example, uh, Gaston, he also has pets. Uh, he has a seagull and uh, a cat. And this, uh, this cat, for example, is playing with a gum, is uh, running all around uh, the place. And then you see uh, that uh, the whole uh, studio is uh, ending up in a mess. Um, his colleagues, they uh, are very close to a burnout. Um, and uh, Gaston, uh, he's uh, taking the phone and he says, I have to call the veterinarian because I think uh, my cat is a little bit overstressed. Now, um, Franquin is considered to be one of the best uh, Belgium artists uh, ever. So I told you that uh, Hergé uh, also respected uh, Franquin's uh, drawing skills a lot. What makes Franquin so uh, special? At first, if you compare uh, the drawings of Franquin with uh, Tintin, um, you could say it doesn't look 
so aesthetic because Tintin, Tintin is beautiful, it's very clear, and so, and uh, the drawings of Franquin, it's a bit more messy, it's uh, a lot of things are happening. But the big quality of Franquin, it's um, the dynamism. Because uh, the drawings of Franquin, they are full with life and movement. Um, as you see in this scene, um, the, when the cat is jumping, you almost can see uh, the cat moving around on the paper. And this is a very big uh, achievement. Something else uh, that uh, is very typical for the style of Franquin is uh, the sound. Uh, it's full with onomat onomatopoeias. Uh, here you see Tom, uh, Chung, uh, Chang. Uh, and Franquin, he said, one page of comics without sound is a page without life. So this was also very important for him. And uh, to show you the importance of uh, sound, uh, this is the policeman of the neighborhood of Gaston. It's uh, his enemy. And if you see him uh, whistling, well, you don't only see him, you can hear the sound of the whistling. And I think this is a very uh, strong achievement uh, to um, manage to get sound out of a page of uh, paper. And of course, in an overview of uh, Belgian comic strip history, I cannot forget uh, this uh, little blue uh, fellows. Uh, they are very small in size, but they are huge in celebrity. I think uh, they are even more famous than uh, Tintin, because uh, all over the world, uh, people know the Smurfs. Um, I must admit that um, a lot of people, they know um, um, mostly the animated cartoons because in the 1980s, the famous um, American uh, cartoon studio, Hanna-Barbera, uh, who also made Tom and Jerry, for example, they made an adaptation of the Smurfs and this uh, was the key to a global success. Um, even at that point, that a lot of people think that the Smurfs are American but no, not at all. They were born in Brussels in 1958. And let me show you the very first drawing of the Smurfs. Um, the Smurfs were born in another comic series. It's called uh, Joan and uh, Pirluit. It's a series um, that finds place in the Middle Ages. Uh, Joan is a knight, uh, Pirluit is a joker. And they come in touch with all kinds of supernatural creatures like uh, dragons and uh, witches. And then one day in 1958, uh, this happens to them. Uh, on the second panel, you see uh, two couples of eyes uh, spying on our friends. Well, these were the, this is the very first appearance of the Smurfs. Now, this was published in the Spirou magazine. And as you know, every week there were like uh, four pages. Um, the children uh, reading this, they were very curious. So they saw there was something hidden in the leaves, um, uh, looking uh, over to uh, our friends, but they had no clue what it was. And a week later, they could see something more already. Because then um, they see a little blue hand and also uh, text bubbles. So they knew that uh, it was blue and it was speaking. And the second panel, so uh, you also see like a little blue uh, foot. But that was all. And um, uh, the poor children, they had to wait like 20 pages. It means five weeks to find out what it was. And then, tadam, this one uh, Smurf uh, popping out of uh, a rock, uh, saying hello to our friends uh, Joan and Pirluit, and inviting them to the Smurf village. Now, this was meant to be only one story, but children, they were so fond of uh, Smurfs that they were uh, writing letters to the artist, to Peo, uh, preaching, oh, please, could you make more stories with the Smurfs? 
And that's how it happened. Um, because um, Peyo, he didn't make only more stories. He also created a spin-off, a separate uh, comic series with only uh, Adventures of the Smurfs. And today, Smurfs have become thousand times, if not uh, 10,000 times more popular than the original comic, than Joan and Pierre-Louis. So far, I've only uh, spoken to you about uh, Belgian comics who were at the region uh, French-speaking. It's true that the most uh, famous classical Belgian comics, they are uh, from origin uh, French-speaking, but doesn't mean that uh, in the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium, nothing was happening. On the contrary, uh, there were some uh, very uh, big artists. Uh, they made uh, great uh, stories. And there are some differences. Here you see some example of uh, famous uh, Dutch-speaking Flemish uh, comics. This is uh, Jommeke. Here we have uh, Nero of uh, Mark Sleen and uh, Suske and Wieske. Now, a difference uh, you can see uh, through these drawings is that um, at the opposite of uh, the French-speaking classical comics, it's not um, stories with one hero, like Tintin, Lucky Luke. It's uh, a family. It's uh, children with uh, uncle and uh, cousins and nephews and so on and friends. And uh, this uh, pleasant group of people, they all together, they live on adventure and travel all around the world. Now, another difference is that uh, the French-speaking classical comics, they were published in magazines uh, like Spirou or Tintin magazines. And this was the rhythm of uh, four or sometimes uh, six pages every week. The Flemish uh, was not like this. This was published in a newspaper. And um, every day, half of a page. Now, this made it uh, more difficult for the creators because every day again, they had to attract their readers and convince them to... Uh, read the next day again uh, the story and buy the newspaper. And for this, they had some tricks. Um, here you have an example of uh, Suske and Wieske. So uh, there is something happening. Uh, Wieske is um, um, in a coal mine. And what we see at uh, the last panel, um, there is uh, something very threatening. There is a shadow appearing with a hand. And, um, of course, uh, you are curious to see what, uh, what is happening, but you have to wait until next day. It's called a cliffhanger. It's exactly the same procedure that uh, we see in television in soap operas. So, uh, here we have another example. Uh, one of our friends, uh, Lambic, is uh, working in a circus. And then, oh my God, something is happening, uh, an accident. Uh, Lambic is uh, falling down, and we are all curious to know if he will survive or not. But I can tell you, he survived. <laughs> um, we have cliffhangers, but there is more, because in a lot of uh, Flemish uh, classical comic series, it's full with uh, mysterious uh, masked people. Uh, so... Um, the whole story, you are uh, curious to find out uh, who is hidden uh, behind this mask, and it's only at the end that uh, the person is uh, taking off uh, his or her mask and that we know who it is. Uh, here an example. Um, this is, uh, the story is called The Iron Mask, and we see this uh, very mysterious character, and it's only at the end we will know who it is. Or here we have a combination of the two. So we have a mysterious character, and then at the end we have a cliffhanger. S another uh, difference uh, between French speaking and Dutch speaking uh, classical comics is that since the Flemish comics they were published in newspapers, they were also read by adults, and that uh, very often in their stories there were two levels. There were um, um, stories accessible for children, um, but there was also 
um, uh, plot lines and humor that was destined to um, adult audience. Here is an extract of uh, Nero, uh, created by uh, Sir uh, Mark Sleen. And um, Mark Sleen, in fact, he was always alluding to politics. Uh, what you could read in the, in the newspaper, well, um, this was reflected in the stories of Nero. This is an extract um, of the story, The Iron Colonel, from 1956. The story finds place in Egypt. Why? Because in this year was the Suez Crisis. And um, in the story, um, two children, they are going by, by motorbike to, um, to Egypt. It's a strange um, itinerary, but still they do it. And on the way back, uh, they pass by Hungary, which is not very logical because Hungary is not really on the itinerary. And at the border with uh, Hungary, they are stopped by a Russian tank. And um, the boy, uh, he starts uh, to speak with the Russians. And uh, he, uh, his, his girlfriend is very surprised. And she says, I never know that you were speaking uh, Russian. And then the boy is saying, well, uh, every evening I learn some Russian because I'm afraid that one day it will be very useful. Well, um, this is funny, but in fact, it's not a humor designated for children. It's humor designated for adult uh, readers because there is a serious uh, reality behind, a reality of uh, which, unfortunately, you are very familiar with. Um, there was the Cold War, and in that year, 1956, uh, Budapest uh, was sieged by Russian tanks. Um, because uh, to knock down the revolution. And uh, this made a shock in whole Europe, also in Western Europe and in Belgium. And there was the fear that uh, one day uh, Russians would also come to Belgium to occupy us. So all this is uh, concentrated in, uh, in this uh, little story. Oh, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> I'm, yes, uh, you see, I could talk for hours, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, we are over the schedule. Um, so far, I only have uh, talked to you about uh, classical Belgian comics. I also wanted to talk to you about uh, the, what is happening today, uh, the more recent comics. But I'm afraid that it will not be possible today. So um, there are two possibilities. Or I come back one day to give you a, a talk about this. Or I invite you to come to Brussels where uh, you can find out more about also recent Belgian comics. Uh, thank you so much for having assistance to my uh, talk. I appreciate a lot, especially because it's a very sunny day that you were here uh, listening to my talk. Uh, it was a real pleasure. Thank you very much.